I'm hugely happy to be here today for the years that I've been working in this world. CIRA has been uh, an extremely prestigious forum for the governance of the internet, for debates about uh, internet issues. And Byron reminded me that he and I were last together, I think, although I think our staffs are back and forth and we certainly uh, attend uh, many of your events in Seoul uh, in, what was it, 2008? Uh, the OECD um, Internet uh, Forum and some very distinguished uh, international company. So um, it's, it's very important for me to be able to address an audience such as yourselves and uh, to have the chance to dialogue with you to attempt to answer your questions, uh, which I will do with some senior members of, of uh, my staff after this formal presentation. So I think we're supposed to start with a cartoon. Aha, there we are. Can you all see it from here, from where you are? At my office, we think that, and, and just coming out of a session on education, that you can't lecture people all the time on how to behave. Sometimes you have to, or even do more. But most of the time, people want to get the message on their own, and it just makes it all the much more fun if we have some cartoons. So en passant, we have over the years developed a series of cartoons on ongoing internet issues, and you are free to download them in both official languages from our, um, our website for any of the uh, uses that you could uh, put them to. I'd like to begin by congratulating CIRA on sprinting past the 2 million line in registered.ca internet domain names. The remarkable growth of the .ca domain name is in keeping with the continued exponential expansion of the internet globally. But along with many wonderful opportunities, this explosion of interconnectedness also brings, as you know, numerous challenges. One especially complex challenge that you've already discussed this morning lies in regulating or not regulating, as some would have it, the internet. Everyone here is aware of the controversy over internet regulation at the World Conference on International Telecommunications in Dubai a few months ago. The impassioned debate was perhaps a sign of how critically important the internet has become to the daily lives of people around the globe, to business and to governments. Against that background, I would like to speak with you about a few of the key challenges that my office and indeed many of my international counterparts are facing when it comes to regulating privacy according to our existing mandates in the digital world. Je vais me concentrer donc I will concentrate on three topics. First of all, law enforcement in a digital time when technology is evolving rapidly. Secondly, the role of governments, and third, the responsibility of uh, businesses, especially when the issues have a world impact. The growth of technology has made those three issues more of more and more concern since the last 10 years. That is, since when I became the commissioner at the end of 2003. First, law enforcement in the era of evolving communications technologies. Second, the role of the individual in safeguarding privacy. And third, the importance of corporate responsibility, particularly in a world where privacy issues are increasingly global. The relentless march of technology has made all three of these issues increasingly pressing in the decades since I became Privacy Commissioner. So to start with the ever-challenging and controversial issue of law enforcement. As more and more people around the world are communicating online, the issue of access to information related to those communications by law enforcement and national security authorities has become an issue. Earlier this month, Justice Minister the Honorable Rob Nicholson announced that Bill C-30, the government's lawful access legislation, would not be proceeding in Parliament. When this bill was tabled last year, Canadians reacted strongly against it and expressed concern that it would have a significant negative impact on their fundamental right to privacy. We were very pleased to see the government respond to those concerns. 
My office has been working on this issue for many years. This issue has been around, in my, to my recollection, since 2002. It just didn't come up with C30. This is only the latest iteration of, of the, same, um, the same enjeu, the same set of issues. Over the years, my office has expressed concerns that Bill C-30, like its predecessors, would have enabled law enforcement to gain warrantless access to subscriber information, such as an IP address. The bill's proponents suggested, you will remember, um, in a very graphic metaphor, that it was simply akin to information in a phone book. But unlike a telephone directory, information behind an IP address is not generally publicly available and can unlock doors to much more information about people. Now, a lot of you are experts here and you know that, but I don't think that's really totally understood by the broader public. So my office's technologists, and one of them is here today with me, have looked at the degree of privacy intrusiveness in relation to the specific information that that bill had proposed to make readily accessible to police. We've seen that an IP address can, in fact, provide a starting point to compile a picture of an individual's online activities, including, for example, online services for which an individual has registered, personal interests based on websites visited, organizations, organizational affiliations, and even physical location. So this announcement relative to C30 was a welcome development for privacy in Canada. And I applaud and I, I'm grateful to the many, many Canadians who spoke out about their concerns with the bill and their deep attachment to privacy rights. That said, the debate has also highlighted questions about existing provisions which permit law enforcement to gain access to personal information without consent. PIPEDA, our private sector legislation, already allows and has done so since the beginning law enforcement agencies and government institutions to obtain personal information without consent for a wide range of purposes, including national security, the enforcement of any laws of Canada, provinces, or foreign countries, that's virtually limitless, or investigations or intelligence gathering related to the enforcement of these laws. We have no ideas, nor do I think does anyone else, how often this occurs and under what circumstances, though we do know that the provision is regularly used by police seeking information from ISPs to link IP addresses with names. I feel that more transparency is needed to show how and why and how often this mechanism is used. PAPITA requires that the law enforcement agency or government institution requesting personal information from an organization identify, and I quote the law, its lawful authority to do so. The term lawful authority is not defined in PAPITA, which has led to some confusion and some uncertainty. ISPs have been inconsistent in how they respond to such requests. This is not um, a criticism. This is simply uh, reminding us of what has happened. And some courts raise cases, raise questions as to the constitutionality of warrantless access to certain types of information in specific contexts. Legislation currently before Parliament, it's been for, for Parliament for more than two years, it's kind of languishing before Parliament, I'd say. Uh, a bill called C-12 includes a proposal to amend PAPITA in an effort to more clearly define what is called lawful authority. The definition being proposed in C-12 attempts to do so by setting out what lawful authority is not. That lawful authority is something, and I quote, other than a subpoena, other than a warrant or an order issued or made by a court, a person or a body with the jurisdiction to compel the production of information, or, and I quote again, rules of the court relating to the production of records. So if this is what it is not, that begs the question, then what is it? It's not clear to me that this approach will actually help at all to clarify what is lawful authority, and it may indeed result in more disclosures without consent to government institutions. My office is, of course, paying very close attention to these issues as we prepare for an eventual appearance, if it comes that far, to share our views on C-12 before a parliamentary committee. But I've also publicly expressed myself uh, 
to the effect that many parts of this bill are ones that I cannot support and should not go forward. I also believe this is an area that warrants further attention during the next mandated parliamentary review of Pepita, something many of you will have noticed that is long overdue. The parliamentary schedule seems to have overlooked the fact that Pepita contains a provision requiring such a review every five years. The last review began in 2006, so by my calculation, we're already quite a bit behind the schedule. I'd like to talk now a bit about the role of individuals and in protecting their privacy. In the early days of the internet, there were enthusiastic predictions about its potential to put power in the hands of individuals, to allow people to easily disseminate information and viewpoints, and to do so for the most part anonymously. Well, those days are here, and increasingly we see individuals posting content, uploading photos and videos, creating blogs, creating their own websites, all of which is great. This user generated content is probably the greatest liberation of the means of mass dissemination, sharing and developing of human knowledge since the development of the printing press um, in the, for the 15th century. And while we do see tremendous, even awe-inspiring benefits, we have also discovered that having the ability to say anything about anyone to everyone is not without downsides for our societies. From my perspective, it raises troubling issues for privacy, for the protection of personal information, and for human dignity. Like most privacy laws around the globe, PEPITA does not apply to personal or to domestic uses of personal information. It only applies in either the federally regulated or the uh, commercial context. The current landscape then raises a number of questions. What is the responsibility of the individual who authors internet messaging? How should responsibility for what gets posted be allocated between social networking platforms, ISPs, and users? And we are beginning to see the courts address some of these issues. Last September, the Supreme Court of Canada rendered a precedent-setting decision in a case called AB versus Sprague Communications a case in which I was happy to say that my office was uh, allowed to be an intervener. This case involved the sexualized cyberbullying of a young teenage girl, called for the purposes of litigation AB, by someone who had set up a fake Facebook profile using a variation of her name and her own photo. AB sought access to the identity of the person who set up the fa Facebook profile. And while Facebook was prepared to give AB the individual's IP address, she still needed the internet service provider to provide her with the identity of the associated individual. Two lower courts agreed that she should be given this information. So far, so good. But they denied young AB's request for anonymity in the proceedings, citing her failure to submit evidence of specific harm to justify either request. Fortunately, to my mind, the Supreme Court of Canada overruled these decisions and allowed AB to obtain the order using a pseudonym. The Supreme Court held that granting AB anonymity would cause minimal harm to the freedom of the press and to the important principle of open courts, compared with the salutary effects of protecting youth from the greater harm of online cyberbullying and the risks of re-victimization upon publication. The decision means that Canadian children and youth who have been the victims of cyberbullying may seek justice without sacrificing their privacy. I think that's a very, very positive development for all our young people and children. But it leaves open the question for the rest of us, adults, about how to obtain justice in the cyber world. It's here that we acknowledge that enhancing privacy literacy, which you've just been discussing, is another very important solution to addressing privacy harms that can result from individuals posting personal information online. Privacy literacy, an important component of digital literacy, means having the skills to engage fully and confidently in the digital world without compromising your own personal information or that of others. Individuals need a better grasp of privacy issues and their importance. 
Why do I say this when there's no denying that many Canadians already displayed sophisticated online skills? As noted in Sarah's own 2013 Factbook, Canadians spend an average of 45 hours a month online, making them the heaviest users of the internet in the world. I wonder if that has something to do with weather like today and yesterday and so on. You literally flee to the internet. We're also quick to embrace the latest developments in the digisphere. Yet while Canadians may be early adopters of new technologies, we could be doing better when it comes to privacy literacy. Some of the ways in which individuals need to be privacy literate, and I know that the uh, preceding panel has gone over some of this, but I'd just like to articulate my office's support for this and, and our own take on this. Individuals need to be privacy literate in order to engage confidently in the digital world. And these ways include respecting the rights of others. For example, not posting photos of them without permission, especially embarrassing ones understanding how to use the privacy settings, of course, on social networks. Realizing that personal information they place online may wind up being used in ways they never imagine, such as being fired from jobs or not even getting a job interview in the first place. And finally, taking appropriate security steps, securing their home wireless networks, for example, which might have avoided some of the fallout from the Google Wi-Fi story um, of last year, and in fact, a staff member who, who worked on that investigation will um, join me for the question period, so you can ask her more about that. In recent years, my office has developed a wealth of outreach materials for youth and for other uh, demographic sectors. For example, we created a graphic novel, hoping that it would be an effective way to speak to younger teens about privacy issues. We've also created youth presentation packages for various age groups with the goal of showing young people how technology can affect their privacy and how they can build secure online identities. Cultivating privacy literacy among individuals is vital in an era when people freely post vast amounts of information about themselves and others, an activity largely outside the scope of PEPIDA and what I can directly influence. Let's now turn to the final topic I'd like to raise today, and that is the issue of corporate responsibility for privacy. It's a truism to note that personal information is often treated like a commodity, and finding ways to make money from our personal information has become a big business. Many companies, from huge mega corporations to small app developers, consider the internet to be a treasure trove of personal information that can be exploited for profit. Too often we've seen companies launch new online products and services with little thought to respecting our privacy laws. And I'm saying that from direct experience. We have case after case after case where we are investigating new products, new services, new websites, new social networking sites where somehow nobody thought that there might be perhaps a regulatory context in which all this could be developed. So we see that many companies have been content to let the innovators innovate and then they call in the lawyers to mop up after the fact. Let me pause here to state very clearly that I don't think there is necessarily a conflict between innovation and privacy. Too often I've heard that say, oh, but we're going to throttle innovation. I think getting privacy right can be a competitive advantage. I think it can help build trust with consumers and I think that there are many ways to innovate and to innovate with profit, and I think we should turn our minds to that. My office is working to enhance corporate responsibility in a number of ways. We meet regularly with businesses and industry associations as part of our outreach efforts. We also provide concrete guidance to help organizations meet their privacy obligations. So for example, my office, along with our Alberta and BC counterparts, you remember there are four jurisdictions in Canada that have uh, uh, responsibility for private sector regulation, BC, Alberta, Quebec, and the federal government. So these three of us launched new accountability guidelines which outline what we expect to see in a company's privacy management program. So I hope for those of you that don't, that hear that, you know, we don't know what to expect, we don't know what to do, that we've helped to make um, our expectations as a regulator clear. 
We've also issued guidance to help organizations involved in online behavioral advertising ensure their practices are in compliance with PIPEDA. And I mention that document uh, in particular because I understand that uh, perhaps some of you here do work in the area of uh, PR and marketing. However, given the increasingly global nature of privacy issues, we're also working to enhance cooperation and enforcement collaboration with our international data protection colleagues. For example, my office in the Dutch Data Protection Authority recently collaborated in an investigation that focused on WhatsApp popular mobile messaging platform. We released our findings last month. The coordinated investigation between ourselves and the Dutch authorities was, I think, a global first, and it marked, I think, a real milestone in global privacy protection, and you're going to see this increasingly um, happen, that not all privacy commissioners are going to go after the same issue in the same global company, but we will uh, refer to each other. I'd like to talk a bit now about some of the enforcement issues that are currently on the table. A growing number of the complaints my office receives raise issues that involve corporations based outside of Canada. PIPEDA's soft approach based on non-binding recommendations and the threat of reputation loss is, I believe, only partially effective against the quasi-monopoly of these multinational internet giants. It seems to me that with vast amounts of personal information held by organizations on increasingly complex platforms, the risk of significant breaches and of unexpected, unwanted, or even intrusive uses of that information calls for commensurate safeguards and financial consequences not currently provided for in PIPEDA. We have seen a number of other countries moving to impose substantial fines. Last month, for example, the UK Commissioner, my colleague Christopher Graham, fined Sony 250,000 UK pounds for the 2011 incident, which had a worldwide effect, in which hackers stole personal information from the accounts of 77 million PlayStation users worldwide. That affected a lot of parents whose kids were on PlayStation. The British investigation concluded that Sony could have prevented the attack by using up-to-date security software. Here in Canada, the House of Commons Committee, to which I report, has been studying issues related to privacy and social media. And when I last appeared before this committee in December, I called for new incentives under PEPIDA, including changes to the enforcement model. I believe such changes are required to encourage organizations to be proactive, to build upfront protections, and to ensure secure treatment of individuals' personal information. And I think here we have to start with good mandatory breach notification, including financial consequences for egregious cases. Increasingly, other countries around the world are implementing such legislation. These type of requirements would reinforce accountability and with penalties provide financial incentives to better protect Canadians' personal information. Alors, pour conclure, so to conclude, I believe it is essential to increase the responsibility of businesses towards protecting private information and raising the awareness of the public facing the risks of uh, harm to private information. Our federal act deals with this matter. I will make the final conclusion. This room understands that the quick growth and the evolution of mobile technology and internet has a potential to improve greatly our society. If we take advantage of this potential, responsibility for privacy and public awareness of privacy risks is essential. And so is updating our federal privacy legislation. I'll conclude with the following. This audience in particular recognizes that the rapid growth and evolution of internet and mobile technology has the potential to radically improve our society if we harness this potential appropriate. Yeah, I'd just like to talk a bit about my staff members who are here on the stage uh, with me because um, increasingly I recognize that I certainly don't have the answer to all the questions. That's why we have a substantial and expert staff. And before a group as knowledgeable as your own, I wanted to make sure that this um, exchange was um, 
was valuable. And so um, on my direct left is Dr. Tara Whalen, who is not only uh, has a PhD in IT technology, she's also completing, and I believe this is the first time uh, this has been done, an MA in uh, law at the University of Ottawa without having done the first degree in law. Uh, and then also joining me is Regan Morris. Regan is one of our very distinguished young generation of lawyers, and he was previously at the CRTC, with whom we uh, increasingly share a number of files, so Regan can give you a very precise answer to many of your questions. Thanks. Thank you. And now your question, sir. Yeah, my name is Andy here. Uh, basically, uh, um, there's been concern about cross-border or cross-geographical issues regarding to uh, privacy. Uh, one, one of the things that we are seeing a lot of uh, international com uh, in companies uh, coming to Canada, basically employing Canadians and basically running their operations. Uh, and most of the information are basically thrown back to their data center, which is not located in Canada. What are those protections uh, uh, principle behind the privacy uh, framework that can ensure that Canadians' information are being kept securely uh, from any company that's basically hiring them from foreign countries, especially in China or in U.S.? Uh, in U.S. especially, if your information is there, uh, means our privacy uh, model is not being respected in, in the sense that because in the name of security, uh, the Patriot Act allows them to look at your information entirely. So what kind of measure do we have uh, in Canada that can protect that kind of a scenario? Did you, yeah. Sir, I'm, and so two things. So just hold the microphone. Could we raise the level of the microphone on the floor because there's quite a bit of din from serving lunch and it's very difficult to hear up here. So if we could just raise this gentleman's mic. And sir, I'm gonna ask you, what was your summary question at the end? We heard most of what you said, but we missed a bit of it because there's just a bit of noise in the room. Yeah, the question at the end of it is basically, what sort of protection is there for private, uh, privacy uh, identifier information that cross uh, to, gen, uh, to, to different borders, uh, especially in China or in US? So how they're housing our data center? Uh, how housing our information in their data center. So what measures are there to protect privacy across international borders? Is That's that right, yeah. Okay. Um, I hope you can hear me too over the plate. Um, yes, thank you for that question. It's, it's a question that came up very early. In fact, it's the, at the heart of what we do. Generally, information of Canadians or from people sent from Canada has to have the same protection as it travels through the world under something we call the accountability principle. So corporations are responsible, not individuals because they're not touched by our law. Corporations are responsible if they're taking Canadians' personal information to make sure that it is treated according to Canadian standards throughout the world. This is a great idea. This is something that we've been working on with major um, uh, global corporations who are responsible citizens. Unfortunately, it's not always easy to put into practice because not everyone is a global um, corporate citizen. So um, increasingly, uh, we are intensifying our links not only with our counterparts in other countries, as I mentioned, but also with other um, agencies who have similar mandates um, in order to make sure that there's a multi-pronged approach to the misuse of personal information. And I'll come back here to some of the problems um, in our own um, legislative framework, the fact that we don't have data breach protection and we, don't, we still don't have anti-spam legislation. Okay, I'm gonna to go to an online question and I'll address the panelists to the monitors. You can see the question here. It's from oh, okay. Garth Graham. Has the attempt to address identity as user-centric at the internet protocol That's level stalled and if so, how could it be revived? Okay, I'm going to kick back to Dr. Graham. <laughs> You're on. Okay, well, um, I wish uh, Mr. Graham were in the room. I might be sure I get some clarification around his point. Um, addressing identity as user-centric at the IP level. Um, I, if I've understood the question, is he sort of asking whether or not 
people can be identified through IP, whether there is a lot of personal identity information in IP. Uh, certainly our office has recognized this for some time. It, it will depend on your jurisdiction, but this idea that people's information is leaked through the IP address is definitely something that we've recognized. This is a key piece of information that will reveal identity uh, information. Uh, but of course, because this is part of IP, which is very standardized, it's not the sort of thing that one turns over as a mechanism of protecting identity so much as you recognize that you can leak a lot of information that way and that you may have to use other mechanisms to protect identity information accordingly. Thank you. Do we have a question from the floor? And also for our technical staff, could you raise Dr. Whelan's microphone as well? Question here on my right. First gentleman right here. Hi there, it's Evan Leibovich. Uh, one of the issues that came up in conversations I had last night was a reminder that uh, because of the way that uh, transfers work, an email sent from a customer on one Canadian carrier being sent to another Canadian carrier, like Shaw to Rogers or something like that, that transfer, that handoff actually takes place often in the US where that data is then subject to the Patriot Act, et cetera. And so the whole concept of creating IXPs is an attempt to, to address that. Does the privacy office have a role to play in this uh, in trying to turn this from merely being a matter of economic expediency into one that actually keeps Canadian data in Canada and doesn't make it subject to uh, foreign disclosure uh, laws? Uh, if I understand the question, um, again, over the plate noise, it's about what happens when um, personal information may pass through the United States, for example, and going to different parts of Canada. How do the laws apply and what can we do? I'll, I'll start out and I'll ask Regan Morris, who thinks about these things a lot more than I do, um, to, to complete it. The position my office takes is that whether or not the information goes out of the country, and I understand increasingly it may be pinged off different places of the world as it travels Canada, the, um, the initial responsibility of those who have collected and sent the information is to make sure this information is treated according to Canadian standards. So we come back to what I was talking about before, the accountability principle. Megan, do you want to? Yeah, I don't think I'd add too much more to that. Just the, it, PIPITA doesn't prohibit uh, international transfers of data as long as you're, you're, you maintain accountability with the organization that, that's collected the data in Canada. Okay, the next question, please. I'm going to go way at the back of the room, and then I'll be coming over here. Hi, uh, thank you. My name is Les Briner, and just Are you, Could you hold the microphone very close, yeah. or we cannot hear Can you? Can you hear me? Go uh, ahead. My name is Les Briner, and just at first, a quick thought for the commissioner. You, you made your job sound so easy, but uh, uh, from my perspective, or at least I think, it's getting more and more complicated and more and more uh, difficult, and, and you have a challenging uh, job in, in front of you, I believe, in terms of cyber uh, 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 privacy. Uh, I do have a, sort of a question that follows up on the IP address issue. It's very closely related to that, and I'm, as an example, uh, maybe many of us here have uh, signed up for Linked Up, and, and maybe some other I can't sort hear. of applications or services that are uh, very useful to many of us. And so uh, the, 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 the intent of these services is to sort of gather information on you and to make money uh, based on that. Uh, whereas, no, Sir, hear. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stop you. Could the person w who's helping the gentleman with the mic bring the mic very, very close? We cannot hear him clearly. So, sir, if you I'm could just repeat your question. For lunch, I guess. Uh, which part did you hear? The first part of my S some break? of it, but perhaps if you could just give us your question, sir. Uh, first, okay, just I, a, I was saying, giving a comment about uh, the difficulty of the commissioner's job and how it's getting more and more complicated. The second part has to do with uh, applications, let's say, like linked up that many of us sign up to, and uh, um, the intent of a lot of those applications is to gather as much information about the person as possible and to uh, use, use it in a financial uh, way 
to better their, their uh, income. How, how, do we, how do we educate people or how do we teach people how to stay secure in, in spite of these, what I would call threats that they're taking on you know, on their own initiative, but at the same time, their their personal privacy is being threatened. Education. Did you get the gist of it? I, I didn't, but Ter, did you? I couldn't make it up. Can the person with the microphone synthesize um, somehow? We just can't understand the gentleman. I'm sorry. I, I, I wonder think if the they question could, was if they how do you wrote, protect yourself when using their... services such as LinkedIn that collect your personal information, where they're collecting your information for the purpose of profiting their company. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, did you it's hear? Okay, can we get another microphone that's not working? Or, or maybe if you wrote it out, we could read it, yeah. you know? Sir, we're gonna get, get you an answer to your question. I'm we just sorry. seem to have a technical problem. I'm gonna come over here and I'll come back to make sure we answer the gentleman's question. Go ahead. Hello. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, okay, my name speak, speak slowly yep. and clearly, please, because we have a little issue here. Sure. Uh, my name is Josh Leslie. Uh, I apologize. It'll take me about 90 seconds to ask my question, but hopefully much less time to answer it. Um, so I see two forces at work um, that I think may put Canada at a disadvantage uh, in, in the near future, and I'm hoping that I can get your perspective on it. So one, uh, I spent the last decade working in the field of sort of human subjects research, and particularly with research ethics boards, and uh, I'm, I'm just gonna call it a risk meme, because I don't know how else to summarize it, but I think that uh, REBs were uh, where this initial worry about the Patriot Act in the United States came from and that's sort of spread more broadly to the hospitals and, and broader public sector, a, a worry about storing data down there and that it's going to be accessed by the US government under the Patriot Act. So that's one force. Um, and it's sort of led to a, an outright ban on using any software as a service for surveys or anything that are, are based in the US and store data on a US server. The other force is uh, you know, new markets that have emerged within the last couple of years um, to support software as a service, so infrastructure as a service, cloud-based services, platforms as, as a service, and there's a real renaissance going on in terms of these new applications and uh, a huge sector of the economy that's kind of come up about. So my concern is, uh, like I've talked to Amazon directly and, and they hold much of this infrastructure and they have no plans to bring physical data centers to Canada. And so I wanted your perspective on two things, sort of one is the substantive merit of that risk meme and how, how, uh, how much we should really be worried about that. Um, and the second is, uh, given that there's not going to be any infrastructure up here and that these are really key portions of this new sector of the economy that Canada's uh, private sector and public sector could take advantage of, but everybody's risk averse to store any data in the states. How do you think that might be mitigated? So thanks very much. Okay, I'll start and then uh, let Tara Whalen and Re Regan um, complete it. This is a variation of one of the other questions, which is what happens to personal information? And basically, who controls your personal information when it goes beyond boundaries? Um, you're not the only person who's raised in the last few years the question of what laws apply in the cloud. Increasingly, you may know that in Canada, in the European Union, um, we're talking about having our own cloud for information that must, may be particularly sensitive. Our position has been that, it, that sending information out of the country, which is always an option, it usually has a price tag attached, um, should depend on the sensitivity of the information and the obligation that you have vis-a-vis -vis to those from whom you collected the information. So for example, the Canadian government, to whom we have to give a lot of our information by law, whether we want to or not, we don't have a choice, obviously has a greater um, responsibility to make sure that there is no um, vulnerability to, to our personal information. Um, 
Tara, do you want to, is there any particular technological aspect you'd like to mention? and your acknowledgement of the risks of transferring information across borders and through data centers where you don't necessarily know who is controlling the data and where it's going. And we have some legislative protectives in place, which I'm sure Regan may want to mention again. Um, but in this increasingly sort of cloud-based cross-border world, um, I think you're right to be as forthright as you've been, particularly with the research ethics, uh, da the data you're getting under research ethics uh, boards regulations, to be alerting people to the potential risks and putting this so that in front of them so that they know what risks they may be engaged in or may be avoiding because you're not sending the data across the border. Uh, this transparency, um, I think people need to be applauded for taking those steps to be transparent about the data flow. Good. So um, we were able to get it written down, the gentleman's question that we couldn't hear before. And the question was, how can we protect ourselves against companies like LinkedIn? which gather vast amounts of data for their own corporate profits. Uh, again, I'll start. Um, can I say that's an interesting question? Because um, LinkedIn gathers information and the whole model, uh, business model that it exploits, is based on the premise that many of us, and I'm sure there's many of you in this room who are on LinkedIn, volunteer this own information for free and for our own personal use, for our personal uh, promotion. This is how we would get to know, um, promote our image and our, our identity in, in the online world. So doubtless LinkedIn to, does you know, deal with data brokers and gets um, all the information that's available publicly, particularly in the United States. Uh, but it is based on the existence of a society where people are willing to give up their personal information. So, you know, I think we have to deal with this in a kind of positive way. This is the model. Many people choose to do it. And I increasingly think the role of my office is to make sure that in running these online social networks, they do it according to the law. Um, I would not say this particular choice of, of, of uh, social networking site has over the years seemed to us to be the most um, careless of people's personal information, far from it. We have currently have uh, investigations going on that are literally quite shocking in terms of, of the misuse of people's sensitive personal information and the misrepresentation of how that, that site is going to use uh, the personal information. Anything? Yeah. Sure. Okay, and I'll take a question in the room in just a minute, and then I'm going to an actual online question now from Susan Feldman. How does the Office of the Privacy Commissioner Regan, feel about on new this? policies on have electronic you on filing? This stuff? How does the Office of the Privacy Commissioner feel about new policies on electronic filing of personal tax returns by net file, particularly in regard to the mandatory e-filing for income tax preparers and removal of access code and use of SIN? Yes, thank you. I know that is a current preoccupation. Um, I'm personally not really up on all the details of that, but I know that my office's initial reaction, and we are in, in contact with Revenue Canada on this, that the, in, in attempt to make things citizen friendly, the oversimplification, um, and it seems to me it wasn't just the use of the sin, it was also the birthday as well, wasn't it? Well, once you've got somebody sent in somebody's birthday, it would sound like you could read their tax information. I know that we're talking to um, Revenue Canada about that in an attempt to um, make that process a little more opaque for third parties. Okay, and another question from the room, so if I can get to an area we haven't been to before. Uh, right here in the center, please. Hello, um, my question is to ask about best practices. If you're doing web analytics and you have access possibly to IP addresses, um, I recognize that I'm not sure whether an IP address is personal information or not in some of those contexts. Um, and I guess the other question I had was about government as opposed to corporations. If Pipeta, does Pipeta apply to government or just to corporations? Okay. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. The first part of the question, I think Tara Whalen can answer, and uh, it's about. Could you repeat your first question, please? 
just slowly. Um, the best practices with regards to collecting or looking at IP addresses when you're doing web analytics. Thank you. Okay, so if you're doing web analytics, wonderful question. Um, so microphone. Is my microphone up? <coughs> ah, that's much better. Okay, so web analytics, a nice specific question. Um, so again, we talked about IP earlier. So obviously, you know, you we mentioned the idea that the personal information can be connected to IP. So uh, you, you need to recognize that that's, if you're collecting that information for the purposes of web analytics on your site, that people who are visiting your site need to be aware that this information is being collected and stored and used for analytic purposes so that they're able to give um, consent for this practice uh, to be occurring. Also, what services you're using for analytics. Um, so bear in mind, are you doing them yourself? Um, are you sending information to a third party to do the analytics for you? That's another information you need to clarify uh, and be made up front. And, obviously for yourself to be aware of. Uh, if it's a third party, is it going to another country? Again, to re return to the question earlier about cross-border issues. Uh, I would also uh, bear in mind for yourself how long you're retaining this information. You probably have a period for which this information is useful for your analytics, not over collecting information you don't need for analytics and storing it for a, uh, such a long period of time that it's no 